This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This weekend off the record, teachers finally getting the COVID shots they wanted, but uh, not before heading back to the classroom. Meanwhile, cops, medics, firefighters, grocery store workers, other essential employees will have to wait a little longer for their vaccines. And why aren't more minorities and poor patients signing up and lining up for COVID shots? We'll talk about vaccination hesitation. Also, supporters of the transit tax say it could bring rail service to North Mecklenburg. North McNeighbors say they've heard that before. Plus, what do you do when the landlord won't accept your rent check? And Stonewall Street, Morrison Boulevard, Behringer Drive, all on the city's list of racist street names that uh, could be changing soon. Plenty to talk about next on PBS Charlotte. Hi, I'm Jeff Sonier, and we're off the record talking about the stories that uh, you've been talking about this week. And if you watch the news, read the news, and listen to the news, well, you'll recognize the names and faces around our virtual table. Dedrick Russell from WBTV, Ashley Fay from the Charlotte Business Journal, and Eli Portillo from the UNC Charlotte Urban Institute. Thanks for joining us uh, this week. Also, you can join the conversation any week. Just to email your questions and comments to off the record at uh, WTVI.org. Well, we heard from the governor this week. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it giving in to what teachers have been asking for for quite a while now, but uh, apparently teachers will be moved up uh, uh, farther to the front of the line and get their vaccinations a little bit earlier than, uh, than otherwise expected. Uh, Dedrick, I don't know if you want to start here since you've uh, dealt with the teachers on a regular basis on this particular issue over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, some teachers are breathing a sigh of relief now. That is what they've been calling for, the, hey, why don't you vaccinate us? If the priority is to open schools 100% to get students back in school, then the logical thing in their minds is to protect us and to vaccinate us. And also you have to just to see that teachers do go to the polls, teachers do vote. And, um, and history shows us that when you upset a teacher, a teacher can take their, um, their frustrations uh, to the polls and either vote you up or vote you down. So therefore Governor Roy Cooper, he knows this, you know, he always talks about his, his mother being a teacher. He always talks about the importance of education. And, um, and look, you know, you, you, when you get pressure from a teacher, especially from a second grade teacher, um, you may have to just to, to, to give in. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of teachers we talk to, they've already made their appointment to get the shot. And then we talked to some teachers who said that, hey, I'm not getting the shot and they don't want to be forced to get the shot. So you have um, all ideas on both spectrums, but the bottom line is that on February 24th, teachers will be able to get in line and to get that shot in the arm that they've been so desperately um, wanting. Yeah, obviously uh, CMS going back to school beginning next week uh, in classes, uh, in-person classes. But, you know, you talked about the politics and I'm glad you did because I wanted to mention that. Um, you know, we've talked so much since the beginning of the pandemic about following the science and not politicizing, you know, what is a health issue, but isn't that exactly what, uh, what teachers manage to do here, pressure the governor, pressure the politicians into making a decision that really doesn't follow the science? Well, there's a lot of conflict about that. I think, um, you know, the new CDC guidelines for opening schools are coming out and uh, early reporting um, from some outlets has said that although vaccinations are one layer of protection, they are not gonna be uh, required as a prerequisite before reopening schools. Um, especially in elementary schools. There have been a lot of studies showing that these are not uh, super spreader places, not necessarily contributing to it. But the experts also say that that doesn't eliminate the risk for individual teachers. So, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act. Although I think what Dedrick mentioned about some teachers uh, not wanting to get vaccinated will set up a really interesting possible future conflict because once you get to a point where everyone has had the opportunity, um, are you gonna have employers trying to require that? And that goes beyond teachers, of course, that goes into a lot of fields where in-person work is required and where people might be coming back to offices. So, you know, once we clear this shoal, I think that they're a lot more ahead of us. In talking to some teachers, you know, they're saying that 
they're going into an environment, as Eli was saying, they are at risk because they have to teach all kids who come to the classroom. Talked to one teacher and one teacher said that when they were in class last year, that a student came to her and said that, hey, my mom didn't want me to tell you this, but my mom and aunt, they're, they're at home sick with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So here you have you know, students who may be in environments where their family members may have COVID-19 and then those kids go to schools, just like you, know, you don't know where the child comes from. So just the message that it sends that how can a teacher give his or her all if they are always constantly thinking that will this be the day I contract COVID-19? So to, uh, to, to, to ease some fears, let the teachers be vaccinated because I've talked to some teachers and teachers say that it is hard during remote learning. It is hard for them. And you know, as soon as we do this, you know, we're losing a generation when it comes to teaching their ABCs and one, two, threes. Yeah, you know, again, I, I don't want to sound anti-teacher here. I, you know, my mom was a teacher too. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, police and grocery store workers and medics, they've all been working in this same, you know, contaminated environment, this threatening environment for months, since March. And they've actually been moved, you know, moved behind the teachers, many of whom haven't been in the classroom since March, or at least been in the classroom on a limited basis. Uh, you know, when you, when you see that, when you see other essential workers still having to wait while the teachers, you know, jump the line, you know, if I were those other essential workers, I'd, I'd have to wonder why, because those other workers have been on the job in the environment all along. A lot of these teachers haven't at all. And um, again, I get the pressure to, to get back into the classroom. Everybody wants that. Um, but uh, again, if I, if I were an, a police officer or a medic or a grocery store worker or a pharmacy worker, I'd, you know, I'd wonder why, you know, why are they jumping my spot? And we have to remember phase three, which is what we're talking about with the yeah. teachers and other essential workers, you know, this is going to be a really big phase. And while we're expecting to be an, an, an increase in weekly supply of vaccines, we still haven't seen a, a huge increase in supply. There's still, you know, it's uh, websites are crashing, trying to get appointments. And it's still very difficult, I think, for a lot of people to get in. And knowing how big this group is, it's going to take quite some time, I think, for all for all these people to get vaccinated. And um, um, you're right. I mean, having that two week, uh, you know, jump ahead, quote unquote, I mean, that is a material advantage. I think there's a 240,000 um, educators that that would um, that would be able to, to be, participate on February 24th. Um, but it's a really massive group. And, um, you know, I, I guess we'll see what happens here. But uh, I think the supply is still a, a major issue here and something that that should be considered. Yeah. And, 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 you know, with the, the, you know, when you look at the economy, you know, when things start to get back to normal, how can we jumpstart the economy? When you have, you know, women who are left their jobs in order to teach their kids at home and people who have, you know, disrupted their lifestyle so they could do the remote learning. So if teachers go back to school, then that will lift up an opportunity for some people to go back into the workforce to start to jumpstart the economy. So I think that, you know, economy, schools, I think it all goes hand in hand. Yeah, it's a cascading thing. In this case, cascading in the right direction. Obviously, getting back to school is everyone's high priority. By the way, I saw some information this week. It was looking at different states and how much access they've had to five-day learning since the beginning. North Carolina, I think they said 14.7% of uh, students have had access to five-day learning, in-class learning. Um, in South Carolina, 70.7% have had that same access. So it just shows the difference of a state line can be the difference in, you know, whether you're kids have been in class all along or just now getting back to class. But uh, I guess we'll talk yeah. more next week about how getting back into the classroom at CMS is going. Uh, it starts with the elementary schools, obviously, and then moves into the upper grades the week after that. But uh, getting vaccinations, whether it's teachers or anybody, I guess is a good thing in trying to get out of this whole pandemic situation. A couple of other things, uh, dentists will now be allowed to give vaccines in North Carolina. Harris Teeter paying its employees $100 each to get the double dose, um, as we were talking about a moment ago. And those uh, vaccination super sites, uh, another one this weekend at the Spectrum Center, uh, the stadium uh, one from a couple of weeks ago, turns out only 30% of those vaccinated there were uh, minorities. And uh, that's kind of 
put a spotlight, one of the things that has put a spotlight on what I'm calling has, uh, vaccination hesitation. Um, we're seeing numbers come out, um, demographic numbers from the state that look at how many uh, in the different demographic groups are getting vecinated and it does seem to be a trend here in Mecklenburg and across the state that if um, you're a member of a minority group you're 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 not getting vaccine uh, getting vaccinated at the same rate as uh, other groups are um, I don't know why does anyone know why it's probably a, a lot of different things I mean we know there's a hesitation among especially the black community uh, around vaccines given the history of how vaccines were used very inequitably and and, and you know racist in a very racist way um, so I think there's there's still hesitancy around around vaccines among that community um, a lot of pastors have come forward saying they're going to speak to their congregation partner with uh, health clinics and, and try to get those vaccination sites into the communities where we are seeing this, these disparities and we're seeing a lack of access. Um, some people have said transportation, of course, may be more of an issue for minorities. So getting to Uptown, getting to that, that, that Bank of America Stadium may not be super accessible for everyone. And, and that might be part of the issue too. But um, you know, I know I know the Observer did a story this week on this subject and a lot of community organizers and, and, and those who, who work in the community with uh, Different residents have said, you know, that it's not surprising to them that they're seeing these these levels. Unfortunately, um, in Mecklenburg County, uh, black residents account for 31 percent of the population, but just 16 percent of vaccinations. Hispanic people uh, comprise 13 percent of the population, but only have received four percent. And it, you have to really think about this, especially as we head into phase three. A lot of this essential frontline workers are black and Hispanic. And I think this is really going to ramp up and become a bigger issue as we move into that phase of, you know, getting um, Spanish Spanish uh, language materials out to the Hispanic community, educating them about where they can go and getting the clinics and vaccines into those communities. I think, um, you know, also with the older population being eligible first, uh, demographically, that's a population that skews uh, a little wider than the population as a whole. That's probably um, a factor, but I think it's important to remember that we're not looking at new disparities created by a new system here. We're looking at the same disparities created from existing systems. So, you know, uh, we're trying to take some steps around that. Um, CATS is making it free for people to take public transportation to uh, the next large uh, spectrum center mass vaccination clinic. But, you know, we're talking about um, communities where healthcare access was already a problem, where transportation was already a problem. When you talk about essential workers, a lot of times you're talking about um, you know, people who don't get paid time off for being sick or, you know, don't have a day that they can say, I'm not going to get paid today, I'm going to take today and, you know, take three buses out to the speedway for a vaccination event, you know, they have to go to work at uh, the grocery store so that other people can buy food and they don't have uh, the time off. So I think that we're seeing a, an expression of the disparities and the fault lines that already exist in our society, not new um, disparities being created by this. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And also, you know, recently I sat in on a virtual community conversation about this very topic and, and they did a poll and some people say that they were hesitant because, you know, uh, they can't get an appointment. You know, every time you, uh, you know, say that there's a vaccination, you sign up and then you can't get an appointment. Um, another thing, um, some seniors don't have access to the internet or to a computer. And so they have to work on how people can call on the phone um, and then also there's some hesitancy because there has been some um, uh, uh, about that second shot. The first shot went OK, but then that second shot, you heard that there's some side effects, fever and things like that. So there could be some hesitancy around that. But the, but the interesting thing is that what I heard on that call is that that trust factor, African-Americans trusting the government. Um, the government has made promises so many times before and African-Americans are still waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. You know, the government says that we're going to give you affordable housing, still waiting on that. We're going to give you good health care, still waiting on that. We're going to give you good education. You know, no matter what zip code your child is, you're going to have a great education. But we're still waiting on that. So now, you know, African-Americans are saying that now the government is telling me to go out and take this, uh, this vaccine when have you fulfilled the promises that you have made for decades and hundreds of years. So, uh, so you know, all of that 
goes through an African-American's mind when the government is pushing them to say, hey, get vaccinated. Yeah, I guess yeah. the pandemic just puts refocuses what is an old problem on a new issue. In this case, it's the pandemic and its effects on education and access and, and equity and that sort of thing. Um, it's another look at the same, the same old problems you know, through, through a new lens, in this case, the lens of a pandemic. And um, unfortunately, it's a health issue that touches all of us, uh, just some of us uh, touched a little bit more so by not just the pandemic itself, but uh, the resources aimed at uh, ending that pandemic. Hey, I wanted to touch one, uh, one more uh, subject on COVID before we move on. Central City Partners this week put out a report on um, growth in the uptown area and uh, the, the South End and Midtown together over the next couple of years. And despite COVID, despite all the losses and you know, business and, and, and uh, hotels and that sort of thing. It looks like it's going to be a good couple of years for Uptown Charlotte um, if and when we get out of this. Uh, Ashley, you, you study real estate um, primarily and cover real estate primarily. Uh, it's got to be good news looking forward as we come out of this pandemic, hopefully, right? Yeah, there's a sense among a lot of people that Charlotte is well positioned, you know, I mean, considering, you know, you're seeing the big exodus out of New York City, you're seeing exodus out of San Francisco, companies and people are just deciding like they don't want to live in a super dense, really expensive market anymore, and are perhaps looking for the types of things that a Southeast city might offer. Um, and and uh, I spoke to Michael Smith, who's, of course, the president and CEO of Charlotte Center City Partners this week. And, you know, he was talking to me about all the prospects they're speaking with and and, um, uh, you know, all the interest that's kind of looking at Charlotte. Um, you're not seeing a lot of companies make big decisions right now. They're still waiting to see where we end up with this pandemic, what their real estate needs are going to be, what their workforce is going to want to do with remote work. But I mean, with the amount of construction that's still kind of slated to come online here and the kinds of capital that are making investments in Charlotte, it, it seems like, you know, when we have a recovery and it will be an, an uneven recovery for sure. But when we have a recovery, Charlotte is positioned to maybe capture some of that demand. Now, that is to say, we still have a lot of sublease space. We still have a lot of you know empty offices sitting in the uptown. And I think a lot remains to be seen about the absorption there. But I mean, the sentiment is that there's still development. We still see cranes in the skyline and, and things are, are going to pick back up. Yeah, hotels yeah, I think in particular, I saw they, they, they 2,000 new hotel rooms online, either under construction or planned for the next couple of years. Um, 10 hotels, either under construction or, or planned. Uh, I guess, you know, what we thought might be a contraction going, going forward might actually be an expansion as we get back to hopefully the old levels of, um, of uh, hotel and service economy uptown and, and elsewhere in Charlotte as well, I, I guess. Yeah, I think, you know, unlike the Great Recession, that was really a financial and a banking crisis. So that hit Charlotte really hard. This time around, we haven't seen those kind of impacts on, uh, you know, those kind of key Charlotte employers. But I think there are a lot of question marks still for individual uh, sectors in that. With all those hotel rooms, are people going to go back to business travel or do they prefer not, not being road warriors? You've had a lot of people who have to reevaluate that. And we're going to have a lot of hotel rooms and office space to fill. And I think it's going to be a rocky, a rocky road back. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then on the flip side, you know, we've all have experienced cabin fever <laughs> for the past <laughs> year. So when we get the green light, you know, you know, and, and, and if you can find a cheap, um, a, 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 an affordable airline ticket to Charlotte, um, why not come to Charlotte for a weekend? Yeah. And then you can tell people so up. Uh, so I think that, you know, forward thinking, that being cooped up in your house and in your neighborhood, I want to see the world. I want to see. I want to go to a place where I can go and uh, and, and have a meal, and you know, and without social distancing. So I guess on the flip side, people are looking at that there are going to be millions and millions of people who are going to you know chomping at the bit to get out of their communities. Yeah. By the way, uh, mentioning the air, the uh, airlines and air, air travel, uh, Charlotte's airport down about fifty percent. Last year, uh, uh, based on the, the last regular year we had before the pandemic, running a little over 50% down this year. Last time we had this few passengers at Douglas Airport, 15 years ago. So that's uh, just gives you kind of a, a, a relative look at how, how much of an impact the pandemic's had on travel and uh, hotels and all the uh, 
all the industries that uh, employ so many in this town. Um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about the transit tax. Eli, I know you've written a lot uh, recently about, uh, you know, the plans for how that money would be used and expansion of, uh, in particular, light rail. But for the first time in a long time, we heard about the light rail, or not light rail, but rail service to North Mecklenburg being a priority. Um, that seems like a shift uh, from what we've heard in the even recent past from CATS in, in terms of what their what their highest priorities are. Yeah, you know, the um, uh, opposition from some mayors in North Mecklenburg towns and uh, from some residents there has been a real potential stumbling block for this transit sales tax. It would need voter approval and, um, you know, having a, a large number of people in that part of town who say, we've been waiting for the red line for 20 years, where is it? Uh, we're not going to vote for this new tax. That would maybe uh, kill the whole thing if it makes it to the ballot. So when they were presenting plans and the latest iteration of the Charlotte Moves Transit Plan and the city's mobility plan today, I'm um, sorry, this week, um, the city staff kind of laid out, here are some things we could carve out for the northern towns, um, you know, greenways, other ways to get around, road improvements, that this isn't just about building a new silver line light rail through Charlotte, um, hoping to garner some support there. Uh, they said um, city manager, um, excuse me, city planner and deputy city manager Taiwo Jaioba said, you know, that we feel like there's movement on the red line. We feel that it is uh, a different situation with new leadership at Norfolk Southern, which owns the rails we need. But that was, uh, it was quashed by the train uh, company. And while the meeting was going on and I was watching it, um, Joe Bruno from WSOC tweeted that he had already just talked to Norfolk Southern and they said from their perspective, nothing has changed. So it sounds like the city is really trying to find some way to work with the Northern towns in Mecklenburg County, something to get them on board to get this referendum um, over the finish line if they're able to get it on the ballot. But I think that we're still, uh, we're still not seeing any real concrete movement like Norfolk Southern saying that they're even open to passenger service on their trains. Right. And if you live in North Mecklenburg, again, haven't you heard all this before? The promise of one thing and then the reality of, you know, those promises left unkept. I mean, uh, that's... Yeah, usually it takes, a, usually it takes a few weeks or a few months, though. Um, this was probably the quickest shoot down of that idea I've seen from Norfolk Southern. It was uh, while the meeting was still going on, their statement was coming out. So um, it's going to be interesting to see if anything can dislodge that, uh, that opposition that they still have to sharing the freight lines with a passenger rail, which they say is, um, is not going to work. Yeah, in the statement, they said uh, freight operations are long distance and customer driven, which precludes passenger only operating windows and temporal separations, such as nighttime only freight operations. And just, you know, again, just said their obligations and responsibilities have not changed yet. And so I guess it remains to be seen, but they've been pretty steadfast in this position for years now. I mean, I can't even remember when they, they first started to say this. And um, I think this is really, as Eli, you know, already said, really an effort to, to court the North Mecklenburg uh, voters and the leaders there. Um, the city did do a poll uh, trying to get a sense for what, how, if residents would support this. And 62% did say they increased funding for public transportation infrastructure and 50% would back the, the county transit sales tax. Some council members questioned, you know, how big of a po polling sample was that um, but they um, they did say in the meeting this week that it was a, a meaningful amount of uh, participants in that uh, but city manager Marcus Jones did say you know we still got a long way to go with uh, you know getting North Mecklenburg on board with this plan and this um, you know tax increase yeah the city manager said it's going to be tough to uh, put a coalition together for this which um, you know to me didn't sound super optimistic I think it's also important to note with the polling that it's uh, it's really hard to poll for these low turnout off year elections. You know, when you only have 15% of the voters showing up, maybe 18 or 19%, if it's a high turnout year, it's very hard to know who's going to come. And if there's a committed group of people who are really opposed to it and really rallying around the idea of, you know, not having um, this increased sales tax, if a small committed group of people is able to rally support in North Mecklenburg, that's a really big problem because it's not a, you know, an election where you're going to have 70% turnout and you can maybe overwhelm that small opposition. 
So uh, it's, yeah, it's a real stumbling fact, block. I don't want to leave this off our, our, our uh, list, uh, but the city council moving forward on changing some street names uh, in Charlotte that uh, are associated with the Confederacy and, uh, and uh, other past racist leaders. Um, Dedrick, how does the community feel about this, uh, this basically symbolic change that the city is working towards? They're saying full speed ahead. Let's do it. Let's uh, let's change those names. In fact, I know one group is suggesting you know names to replace those names. And so there are there's a, a a movement that is happening to make sure that this does not get lost. Because you know last year was a year where people went out and protest of all ages, all races. They went out to protest. So therefore, uh, the community is going to hold leaders accountable. Leader said that we're going to do this. Leader said that we are hearing you, that we're going to do something. And so you're going to have the community, they're going to hold people accountable for the words that they say that they, we will make change. And this also shows intention that we are in, this is, we're doing this intentionally that in order to make you know, Charlotte an inclusive place and not exclusive, then we have to, to change these names. Because CMS did it. So now CMS is saying that, hey, now it's your turn, city. Yeah, the city's talked about it for years. It does kind of feel like its time has come and uh, we'll see what the council does. It was a unanimous vote for the committee recommendation. We'll see what those names change to over time in the next couple of weeks and months. Hey, we're out of time, but I do appreciate uh, our gang being here this week uh, as always and uh, our gang at home, our faithful watchers who uh, join us each week. Uh, we appreciate your, your viewership. Uh, we welcome your questions and comments and uh, we'll see you next week right here on Off the Record. Production of PBS Charlotte.